Thank you, President Paxson, Dean Elias, and Dean Tunkel, to the esteemed faculty and staff, and to the celebrated class of 2020 and your family and friends. Thank you for having me. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Beth Gentilesco, and I'm an internist at the Miriam Hospital, where I work as a hospitalist. Lately, I've been working on the inpatient warm unit where I supervise the residents while we care for patients admitted with COVID. In addition, I serve as one of the residency program directors and one of the site directors for the medicine clerkship. And of course, one of my favorite jobs is mentor and coach. Well, this is not the story we were going for. I had imagined it much differently for all of you. The envelopes and the balloons of match day, that was not to be. And I have not given a single congratulatory hug. And even now, no campus dance, no pomp and circumstance, no regalia. So I guess that's life. You know, my patients come into the hospital and often say to me, Doc, it's true, the patients actually do and will call you Doc. I can't come to the hospital. I didn't plan for this. This wasn't supposed to happen. And once a week for the last 20 years, about, which is 1,000 times, I have said, it's okay. The hospital's full of people who didn't plan on being here. But this is what we do. We'll be all right. So I'll say that to you as we rewrite your story. It's okay. The world didn't plan on this, but this is what we'll, this is what we do. It'll be all right. This reminds me of my friend Al. Al was my best friend in residency. I could trust Al to see the irony or the absurdity in any and every situation, and we could share in that. Well, one time, Al was the leader in a code situation, and he asked for some medications to be drawn up. And then one of those medicines was given in a large dose before the team was ready for it. Al looked around calmly and said, okay, well, you can't suck it out. And then proceeded to figure out a way quickly how to alter the plan and help the patient. But this ability to be cognitively nimble when the stakes are so high, they don't come easily to everybody. And it does not come easily to me. You can't suck it out, has become a bit of a cautionary mantra for me, a reminder that thinking comes in more than one flavor. So this brings me to the first of my three lessons for the day. Think. I know that this is not a surprise to any of you who know me. I like to think. And I'm told you can kind of watch it happen. You can watch the wheels turning, that is. But now, during the pandemic, thinking is an urgency and a necessity. As I've witnessed the world, the country, the state, the hospital, the medical school, trying to reckon with reality, I'm reminded why our parents sent us to college, so that we would be in a position, such a privileged position, of being expected to think as part of our job. The pandemic has rendered thinking, considering, weighing, and deliberating of paramount importance. Have we thought of what might happen if we do X? Have we considered the models if we do Y? Can you imagine three steps ahead? You can! This is what we've been teaching you over these four years. Both with respect to medicine and to human nature, you are armed with the thinking ability to be at the table and to say, hmm, this plan doesn't make sense, or I'm not sure I understand the procedure. You can't suck it out. So let's figure out a way forward. As I said, the fact that I'm espousing a carefully thought out plan or process is not shocking. Yet amazingly to me, we still need to be reminded and we need to honor and celebrate it. We should make and implement plans with careful consideration. We should imagine the permutations. Now, more than ever, it's clear that we have to. The innovations we've witnessed now, face masks of all kinds, telemedicine, remdesivir, a vaccine, big and small changes because we are thinking. There's room for me and for Al. Room for my slow and deliberate planning with multiple contingencies, 
and room for Al and his high-stakes troubleshooting. Ideally, each of us should work to strengthen both kinds of thinking. The rapid change during the pandemic has underscored this need for thinking, but we should be doing this all the time. Let's use this time of upheaval to celebrate the thinking and deliberation that's necessary to move forward. And moving forward should mean growing. It doesn't always, but it should. Which brings me to the second lesson of the day, which is growing. I don't know about you, but in the past two months, I've said and done a lot of things, both at home and at work, that I've never done before. And you know what I mean, it's not like skydiving, but like having a Zoom family reunion, or sending condolences over the phone, or putting a mask on when I pass you on the street. And in the hospital, this has been really amplified. When I'm working on the COVID unit, as I am today, my daily work is really different than it was before. And I'm saying a lot of different things. I'm telling families that they can't come into the hospital even when their family member is dying, that they can't be with them. I'm telling some that I won't offer heroic measures of resuscitation. It's almost impossible for me to say these things, but I have to. So here's what I propose. If we can say these things to patients and families, things that are so hard to hear and so hard to digest because the world demands it, and we expect them to come with us, let's agree to also be on the receiving end of something that is hard to hear. Let's be open to the growth that is coming our way. Now, the good part about the group of you is that you don't need to look very far to find this opportunity because internship is nibbling at your heels. For some of you, I know it's already here. Well, for me, internship was the most formative period of growth in my life. We all know that growing is hard, but why? Well, for one, growth is often about hearing and absorbing things that you don't want to hear or absorb. And it often comes at you at a bad time and sometimes too fast. I think about these patients and families during the pandemic. It's bad news too fast. Well, internship was monumentally hard for me. Having to bear witness day in and day out to the suffering, to the intimacy and the humanity, it took me a really long time to get used to. And I guess I fought it. Or at least I wasn't able to recognize what was happening. I often felt like I was losing. It's the one thing I wish I had known. That is, that the growth during internship is profound because becoming a doctor in the world should be, it should be personal and intimate and humanizing. That metamorphosis should be profound. It requires patience and acceptance and time. And I wish I had been more patient and understanding with myself, accepting of the growth as it happened. Instead, I was tired and tearful and unable to put the pieces together with any grace. So, I wish that for you as lesson number two, grow. And by that, I mean, let internship wash over you the way it's supposed to, helping you to transform into the citizen physician we expect of you. And remember, if we're asking this of our patients and families during the pandemic, let's ask it of ourselves too. I guess I believe that's the kind of thing that makes the world a little better each day. So now that we've thought and grown, what do we do now? This brings me to my third and final lesson of the day. This is about a new idea. We're told that a large percentage of what we're taught in training is wrong. But how do you know which part that is? In general, we hold on rather ardently to what we've been taught. So how do we reconcile this? I think that the answer is in an openness to a new idea. If you are not open to a new idea, you will cling to the old and you will fail to change. For those of you who know me, 
you may know what my example of a new idea is, because I talk about it a lot. It's about racism, or race and medicine, or about equity and diversity. This was not something, something that many of the faculty learned in medical school or residency. In school, we were taught that there were racial differences in disease presentations, and we learned how to answer the stereotyped multiple choice questions. That was pretty much it. And we were told to use interpreters, but we often couldn't find one. And during residency, I learned incorrectly, mostly by innuendo, that race and ethnicity are biological distinctions, and that these biological differences are part and parcel of what it means to be of a certain race. I learned that some diseases have a greater prevalence in certain communities, but I didn't learn why. And I learned that sickle cell disease was like the marquee racial disease. In fact, everything I learned about race and medicine was wrong. Just wrong. Race is really not a biological descriptor, and in fact, biologists often shy away from this political hornet's nest, with some intro bio textbooks leaving out the word race entirely. And I understand why this is complicated and it's a multi-layered issue with huge ramifications. And the terms equity, diversity, inclusion, social determinants of health, these realities, these truths, existed. Of course they did, but the terms and ideas weren't taught in school or in residency. In fact, they were considered to be outside the scope of medical education, more of a social science issue. But look where that has gotten us. The life expectancy and health levels of our citizens vary greatly by our zip codes, by our immigration status, by our skin color, by our parents' level of education. The medical effects of these social drivers are breathtaking. I hope that you have been following the news and have seen the devastating realities of these inequities during COVID. I could have missed this. If I hadn't been exposed to different thinking and sat and read, I would have missed this and I would have been a lesser physician for it. I don't know what's going to be the world-changing big idea for you. Of course I don't. But if you don't leave space for the possibility, then you have no hope of that seed germinating. I'm asking you to be ready for that new idea when it comes your way. Okay, well, that's three lessons. One, think. Two, grow. Three, embrace a new idea. For good or ill, you can really accomplish all these in one day of living in the pandemic. COVID-19 continues to challenge me every day to think carefully, to grow by making mistakes and correcting my course. And my goodness, there are so many, many new ideas. But you can't stop there. This is a lifetime membership. If you're good and lucky, you will think, grow, and learn with an open mind for your whole life. I am very proud to be part of this profession that expects this of me, and I expect it of you. All of us on the faculty wish for you a safe and happy transition to residency and beyond. We are very proud, and I am very proud of you and your accomplishments. Congratulations. Thank you.